In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to start by reading you a quotation from the Holy Scriptures. They said one to another, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the way, while he opened to us the Scriptures? And they told these apostles what things they had done on the way, what things were done to them, and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. It is in this manner that the holy apostle and evangelist Luke records for us the encounter of the holy apostles who had met with the risen Christ as they traveled towards Emmaus after his holy resurrection. The apostles as I'm sure you remember, had fled from the cross. They did not understand the extent of his love, which would lead to his passion and even to the death of their Savior. They had abandoned the tomb, though the women had remained faithful. They had scattered. They had been divided, separated by their fear and their heartbreak. The communion of the Lord's chosen ministers, which had been bound together during his earthly life, was interrupted. And in this state, in their division, in their disunity, they did not recognize the risen Lord in his glory when he appeared to them on the road. Their hearts were divided and they could not see. And then the gospel recounts for us, the Lord opened their eyes. But it was not, interestingly enough, his words that did this. It was not anything that he said to them. He expounded the scriptures to them, showed how the Holy Scriptures pointed towards himself, and they were amazed by his words. But they still did not see him for who he truly was. They begged him to come and visit, to spend more time with them, but still their vision was not clear. They did not know to whom they were speaking. It was only when they sat down at the table with the bread and the wine laid out before them, so similar to the setting of that supper that they had shared with Christ before his betrayal, the mystical supper in which you and I each participate every time we celebrate the divine liturgy. It was only then that in the words of St. Luke's account of the Holy Gospel, he sat at meat with them and he took bread and he blessed it and break it and he gave it to them and their eyes were opened, and they knew him. Their eyes were opened when, in his divine mercy, the risen Lord sat in the midst of his apostles and returned them to communion with himself. When they are divided, the apostles are blind, truly spiritually blind, so blind that they do not even recognize the Lord of creation who had plucked them himself from the sea of this world who had tenderly walked with them through this world, through this age, showing them the miracles of his glory, whispering into their ears and into their hearts the truth of everlasting life. They did not even recognize him. But when their unity is restored, their understanding of truth burns within them. Their hearts are aflame. Their sight is restored and they see the Lord in his glory. And it is then that they say, echoing the words, of the women. The Lord is risen indeed. It is with this sacred image that I wish to begin. My beloved fathers and brethren and the youth of the church. When they are divided, the Holy Apostle's spiritual sight is hindered. But when the Lord makes them one, they see sights beyond all the glories of this world. When they are divided, they struggled to proclaim the gospel that had been entrusted to their care. But when the Lord calls them to unity, the gospel shines forth from their hearts and their lives with enough power to transform all of creation itself. And that is what leads me to you, the children of God, the church's precious youth, who by the Lord's mercy are here today in the year 2012, living lives every bit as precious to God as those of his holy apostles, and who stand in a unique position in the history and the life of our church. Every generation of Orthodox faithful has its own experiences, its own 
set of cultures. It lives in its own world, shares its own special joys that are unique to itself. But there are also common traits that run from one generation to another. And the fact of life over the past century has been that multiple generations of Russian Orthodox Christians have shared the sorrowful experience of division, of disunity, beginning with the godless execution of the Tsar Nicholas II and his royal family, which by the Lord's infinite power was transformed into a godly martyrdom and a passion bearing witness to the true God. Beginning with this, worldly division began to be thrust upon the Russian Orthodox Church. Though at her core, she was always one, but the body of Christ can never be rent apart. As the atheistic revolutionary regime took power, the sorrowful story of division began to advance, a story that we know very well, about which we've heard from my very reverend brother and father, Archpriest Alexander, earlier in this conference. Because we've heard so much about it, I don't wish to speak too much of this here, only to bring back to mind briefly the various textures of that division. The subjugation of the church in Russia to the state, the formation of our temporary autonomy in the church abroad while she waited for God to restore the righteous, as well as the even more sorrowful realities that sometimes came up through this division, ill will, suspicion between brethren within the separated Russian Orthodox Church, passions that often flared up into anger and bitterness, mistrust, and fear and pride which the devil sometimes enticed in our hearts, making our separation all the more tragic. It's important that we not forget these things, these pangs and sorrows, as the Holy Prophet Isaiah calls them, that are like the travails of a woman in labor that ultimately brought about much spilling of blood. And yet God in his mercy took that blood and used it to water the earth and to prepare it for repentance. But today I want to speak to you not about our past, but about the future. As Father Alexander said in his lecture, quoting Shakespeare's The Tempest, what's past is prologue. It is the introduction, not to your grandparents' story, nor your parents' story, nor my story, but to yours. All of these previous generations have grown up experiencing divisions within our beloved Russian church in one way or another. Some, including the family and relatives of many of you in this hall, had this experience directly at first hand. They were there as the bells of revolution began to sound. They watched as a godly king was impiously slain. They were forced to watch as crosses were torn down from cupolas, where cathedrals dedicated to the eternal service of God's glory were destroyed and razed to the ground. For others, the experience of this division was more secondhand, knowing of these events and growing up in the changed landscape of Russian life people who grew up as exiles, displaced, whose parents passed along memories of a homeland that simply no longer existed. Still others had very few personal connections to Russian culture or history, but they also grew up in the context of division that arose out of it, where the church was not, in clear worldly terms, one. And others still, including many of your own families, were brought into the life of the church through conversion, being received by God's extraordinary mercy into his body, which sadly bore the earthly marks of our rebellion and our separation from one another. So whether directly or indirectly, every generation has shared the experience of a Russian church in the toils and pains of a unity that was not fully manifest, except yours. While all of you here today were obviously alive before the restoration of unity, which happened only five years ago, and let us always remember we are here to celebrate that fifth anniversary. Most of you, though, at that time were in your early teens, some of you not yet in your teens. Certainly, this is old enough to have been aware of the church's ecclesiastical situation, 
But glory be to God, not old enough to have it shape the fullness of your experience. You are in the extremely privileged position of being the first generation in a century that will grow up from your youth until the moment that our Lord calls you to his glory in a unified Russian church. And I want to stress to you today, if I do nothing else in this talk, what a miracle that is. Your parents could not say this. Neither could your grandparents. They prayed fervently for a day. And many of God's precious children martyrically offered up their lives interceding for a day when a generation would once again live on this earth in the embrace of a Russian Orthodox Church that was wholly united in this world. But those martyrs did not see this day in this life. Indeed, I can think of no better words to describe the miracle, the wonder of your generation than those of St. Paul, who 2,000 years ago reflected on all of the generations that had come before him in a letter that he wrote to the church, to the Hebrews. He said the following. It's one of my most beloved passages in the sacred scriptures describing the martyrs who had gone before. Many, he says, had trials of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskin and goatskins, being afflicted, destitute, tormented, of whom this world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains, in the dens and the caves of the earth. And all of them, having retained and obtained a good report through faith, yet did not receive the promise. For God had provided something better for us, that without us they should not be made perfect. And my brothers and sisters, so it is with you. We sit here today so freely, so peacefully, so wonderfully. But you must never forget that your life in the church, the very fact that you are here in this conference today, is a gift that has been purchased for you by the blood of more martyrs than the earth had ever produced for God's glory in all of human history. Men and women, young and old, even children, gave up their lives for you and for the God who loves you. But even they did not see this day. For if I can paraphrase St. Paul, God had provided something better for you, that without you, they should not be made perfect. And today, it is yours. As I said before, you are the first generation in a century for whom the unity of the church is simply a fact. A memory. It is not something to be desperately hoped for, painfully worked towards. It is a reality, the foundation and the basis of your life in the church. And this makes your generation truly precious, truly a miracle. None of the rest of us in this room can share what you have. We will always be marked in our experiences, in our trials, in our struggles, in our memories, by the experience of the vision though by God's love and mercy we also are marked by the profound and the humbling joy that comes from having seen the vision overcome and repentance raised above fear and unity restored in this world. And we will treasure this every minute of our lives. But we can never know what you know, a life from youth to death in the experience of a church wholly unified by the grace and the love of God. So I want to stress then, in my remaining time this afternoon, and I promise I'm not going to go on for too long because we've all had lunch and lunch puts us to sleep. But I want to stress two things. This gift that has been given to you provides you with unique and wonderful opportunities, but at the same time, unique responsibilities in the world. The opportunities before you, my beloved brothers and sisters, are profound. If I can speak for a moment on the spiritual level, you are grounded in spiritual unity in a precious and unique way. And this has the power to make your lives 
into something truly inspiring, truly wonderful in the real sense of that word. Your whole lives can be rooted in the profession, a singular profession of the gospel, which speaks so powerfully of unity and communion. You need not proclaim this gospel while at the same time apologizing for the disharmony of the church's structure and shape. Though obviously there are areas of division and disunion that still remain, that must be approached with repentance, with humility, with love. The kind of repentance and humility that we saw in our hierarchs and our fathers who were willing to find the path back to reunion despite so much baggage from the past. But in your lives, the oneness of the gospel can be completely manifest as God wills it to be rooted in the singular foundation of the church's real harmony. Similarly, you will grow throughout your lives in a church that is no longer temporary in structure and form, as the church abroad was since the days when our holy forefathers constructed it in precisely that manner, foreseeing spiritually in the depths of their heart this very reunion. Though the church abroad has been a sacred haven of holiness and repentance throughout her history, the division within the church meant that she has long been home to a people who knew too well the meaning of that great spiritual song of King David. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and we wept. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We looked back to that spiritual unity, weeping, remembering its holiness. But you live today within it. You will still weep for your sins. You must weep for your sins. And this psalm will always resonate with every soul who is far from the kingdom of God. But your spiritual hymn in the church can be one of wonder in the mercy that has brought you back to your home, who has brought the church into a unity that reaches out over the whole world, echoing another psalm that can be your song. Where could I go, Lord, and flee from thy spirit? If I should ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, thou art with me also. If I should take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there thy hand shall lead me. Thy right hand shall uphold me. And perhaps one of the greatest opportunities that you have is that of mission in the world, which is always the fruit of unity in Christ. Remember those holy apostles, those men who are amongst the greatest missionaries in the history of humankind, how even they could not recognize the Lord when they were divided by their fear. And these were his 12 apostles. Then look towards the great feats of mission, of preserving holy tradition and real piety, of proclaiming the faith and saving souls that our church has accomplished over the past century. All of this with division ever in the background. And then you will understand something of the mercy and love and compassion of our God. But you are like those two apostles in the upper room with whom Christ sat at the table breaking bread after his resurrection, whose eyes have been opened. You will live, may God preserve it, throughout the whole of your lives in this precious communion. Think of what wonders God can accomplish in you if he has done so much in your fathers and forefathers despite the turmoils of life that they experienced. Think what he can do with you. You will always be called to do what our fathers and forefathers in the church abroad have done to preserve the spiritual traditions of the Russian Orthodox heritage in a world that so often despises them. To give honor to that culture which saw the gospel flower into the baptism of a whole land and her peoples. But you are uniquely gifted to take that mission further. Your primary mission is not to await return to Russia following the revolution. Your mission is to stand right here in this place or wherever God may put you in your life and breathing in your lungs the spiritual breath of that godly Russian Orthodox heritage with the blood of the martyrs spiritually coursing through your veins to transform the world around you into the glory of the Holy <coughs> Trinity. The church is your future 
And I would ask you please to remember this saying of Metropolitan Filariet. I quoted it to some of you a year ago in Paris. We so often hear the phrase, the future of our church is the youth. But this is absurd. It's the other way around. The future of our youth is the church. It is there that you will find your future. And if you are faithful and loving and pious and humble, your future in the church might become the medicine for healing a very sick, very tormented world. You can speak to that world. It's being handed to you. All of those martyrs who died for Christ, of whom St. Paul said the world is not worthy, are looking at you and they're saying, this is our gift to you. We have kept this world alive in existence through our prayers, and now we give it to you. So go and fulfill what we have started. And this leads me to your responsibilities, which are unique in the church, as the first generation to go through your life in the fullness of her reunion. I hope that all of you, when you reflect on what has been done for you, what has been given to you, through God's love and through the sacrifice of so many, will feel like the holy apostles whom, to whom Christ opened the scriptures and showed its real meaning, saying to each other, did not our hearts burn within us when we heard these things? But you cannot simply hear these things, receive these things, and then go about your life as you did before, or go on living like others in this world. You have been given something far too wonderful for that. It simply will not do for any of you to receive this wonderful new life from Christ and respond by giving back to him anything other than the fullness of your own life. You are human. You are frail and weak. And like me, you are filled with sin. Yet God says, come to me and I will make you whole. Please, my brothers and my sisters, there can be no excuse for us if we do not run to God with our whole hearts. He says to you, to me, to each of us, evil caused pain and pride and division and hatred, but I have overcome the world. I have heard the voice of my martyrs crying out to me from the earth like once I heard the blood of Abel, and I have given you something better. You, each of us, we're not worthy of this. None of us is. Yet you must take what the Lord gives you and never live the same way again. Your responsibility in this life is not necessarily to go out and found organizations and activities and programs and schools, though I might pray that filled with godly zeal, some of you will give your lives to such worthy acts. But your chief responsibility is to cast aside any fear that is within you, any timidity, any hesitance in your hearts, and live lives worthy of the high calling to which you have been called. The world will not understand you if you live like this, but you live for one who is greater than this world and who has the power to heal it and redeem it. You must be bold in your Christian calling, and I feel ever more inclined to say this to young people, that boldness is required. The world around us seeks to shut us up, to rule out our voices, to mute what we have to say, to sideline us. The persecutions that we face today may not be done, may not be accomplished with guns and knives and prisons. More often they are accomplished with laughter and silence and mockery. But just because it is less physical does not mean it is less real or less direct. The world will not understand you, and yet you still must be bold. You live for one who has power more than these. You must be strong in your Christian calling. Everything in the church is provided for your redemption. It must be embraced. It must be used to create in your hearts a living embodiment of God's gospel. You do not all have to become teachers or preachers or monastics or priests, but there is not one of you in this room who does not bear the responsibility to save this world. 
was Father David quoted to you yesterday. Our Father among the saints, Seraphim of Sarov, spoke of precisely how we are to accomplish this. Acquire the spirit of peace within you, St. Seraphim said, and a thousand around you will be saved. Live Christ's life, and the world will encounter Christ when it encounters you. It will see him, and it will be saved. If you would do this, this thing that God calls you towards, you must give your heart fully to God and live completely in the heritage you have received in this unified church for which he died. Where there is sin in your life, you must struggle to overcome it and find real repentance, knowing that the Lord is merciful, that he rejoices over a lost sheep that is found and returns to life. If you want to help the world, you must learn to love the opportunities for repentance that Christ provides in the church. We spoke yesterday in one of the panels, in the panel discussion, about confession and repentance. I know so often it is frightening to confess. Hopefully you have been orthodox plenty long to not be afraid of standing in front of a priest, but we are often afraid of our sins. It's not so much that we are embarrassed to admit before the priest the things we have done. We're embarrassed, we're frightened to admit them to ourselves. When I say aloud the reality of my life, it is frightening. And yet God's mercy is so rich, his love so profound. What more could we possibly ask for in this life than that at every opportunity that we sin, we can so freely go to God and receive his forgiveness. We have been blessed with a profound miracle that should be the source of our joy. Where truth must be spoken, you have to speak it. This is also your responsibility. Even if it is unpopular, difficult, or potentially costly. Remember the account given yesterday by our beloved Vladika Fyodorsi, who recounted how even being seen to be a Christian, to be seen standing near a church in his Soviet-era youth could result in mockings, expulsions from schools or colleges, even government harassment in the workplace, agents showing up and accosting you at work just for being seen standing near a church. And having received our Orthodox faith from men such as these, are you going to stand shyly about silent in your Christian beliefs because you're worried that someone might think you a bit silly or out of touch for proclaiming them. Is that really how we are going to embrace what has been given to us? So often that's how we act. We know we should speak. We know what to say. God even gives the words right onto our lips, onto our tongue. And yet we're worried that we'll be laughed at. We're worried that someone won't invite us to the sorts of events we want to go to if they think we're that sort of person. And so with the words of God right on our tongue, we swallow them and we do nothing. You cannot live like that. You have to be better than that. When your Christian brother or sister is struggling, help them. In this world in which we live, brother watches brother suffer and does nothing. Man watches entire societies fall into immorality, pain, and despair, and says nothing. But you are Christians. Your family tree includes sons who gave their lives to preserve the dignity of their fathers, brothers who suffered torment even unto death to safeguard the purity and the piety of their sisters. Are you going to watch as your friend, perhaps one of the people sitting here at a table right next to you, struggles with his or with her sin, whether it's moral or ethical, alcohol, gossip, drugs, sex, anger, anything else, are you really going to simply stand by and do nothing because you're a little uncomfortable about speaking of it? Don't be like this. Love one another more than this. You have the opportunity to be helpful, spiritually, physically, eternally, a source of help to these very people sitting here with you today. Rise up to that calling. 
It is a gift that has been given to you. I don't want to go on for too long, but I want to think down the road. I want to picture life 30 or 40 years from now. Our beloved church, let's say 40, maybe even 50 years into the future, people like me will be old, probably frail. But what will you all be? The storms of this world are still going to be battering the church. The devil will not relent. How are you going to withstand them? There is one dark possibility, that you will have let your faith become lukewarm, that you will have come to nice conferences, you will have enjoyed your time together, you will have gone to the liturgies, you will have learned your prayers as children, as young people, but that you will have allowed the world to tell you how to think and how to live, that you will have given in to a very different life, because of fear, or embarrassment, or laziness, or some other set of temptations. And then when the storms come, and they will come, it will be a very sorrowful day, and there will be much sadness and suffering in your lives and in the whole of the world. But I think we can also see a far more beautiful, glorious vision, one in which your hearts, inflamed with the love of God, Cling fast to his word and to his law every day of your lives, in which you speak love and truth into a world that is so very afraid, shaping it by your lives. Then the storms will come, but you will be built upon the rock of the church, and they will not prevail over you. This is the vision of the church which we must hold in our heart, which we so long to see. In that day, your youth will have become full maturity in the life in Christ. Some of you will have families, children, to whom you will impart the law of God, his love, and the life in the church. Some of you will be mothers, creating and nurturing the newness of life unto a new generation. Some of you, I fervently pray from the depth of my heart, will be angels on the earth will become monks and nuns. And some may even be called to serve as God's priests. And what a joy all of us who are here today in black robes will find in that day. We who have so unworthily tried to help you, to stand before some of you who are in this room today, who every day come and take our blessing, and one day say to you, Father, bless me. Christ is in our midst. That is the vision we want to see. That is what God calls you towards. And it is so easy to make this a reality. Above all, my beloved brothers and sisters, when Christ calls you to act, act. You do not need to have all of the answers to your life worked out yet. Where you will go, what you will do, how you will live. I've spoken with some of you. I know some of you are wondering about college and university. Some of you are wondering about marriage or monasticism. Some of you wonder about work and mission and the shape of your Christian life to come. Be at peace with these things. You do not need to know the answers to all of these questions yet. I know it's a strong temptation. It creates worry, sometimes even fear, that we don't know the answers. But trust that God will show them to you in his good time. He cares for each of us as his precious children and will not let us wander far from his guidance. You don't need to know the answers, but you need to be like the Holy Prophet Isaiah, who had a divine vision in which the Holy Trinity spoke to him saying, whom will I send and who will go for us into the world? And the young prophet replied to the voice, here I am, Lord, send me. These need to be your words also. Here I am, Lord, send me. Use me as you will. Do with me what you like, for I am completely yours. And my greatest joy is to do your will. Perhaps we can take as our own 
the words of the patron of this very conference, our beloved father, the Venerable St. Herman of Alaska, who once, while traveling by ship and speaking to the sailors about the love of God, said, for our good, for our happiness, let us make a vow at least to ourselves that from this day, from this hour, from this very minute, we will strive above all else to love God and to do his holy will. Let that be our prayer. Not to say, oh, tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. There are people who go through their whole life saying, I will become holy tomorrow. I will start to repent tomorrow. I will start to take my Christian life seriously tomorrow. And tomorrow never comes. We say it so many times that we reach the end of our life still saying tomorrow, and we have made no beginning. Let us hear the words of St. Herman. From this day, this hour, this very minute, let us strive above all else to love God and to do his holy will. It's really on this note that I want to leave you with the divine charge to give your life completely to God. Do not forget your past. Live in its sacred memory every day of your life. But know that you have been given a precious gift and the next generation of the Russian church, your generation, is that toward which the prologue of the past has been looking and hoping and waiting and praying for so very long. Know that all of us in the church, the hierarchs who shepherd us with their apostolic grace, your priests, your pastors, your deacons, your spiritual teachers, all of us will find our greatest joy in watching you become the next generation of pastors, saints, prophets, martyrs, and teachers. Though the righteous in heaven know how to rejoice far more deeply, it is them and only them who rejoice more than your priests when we watch you find joy in your spiritual life, when we watch you struggle to overcome your sin, when we watch someone come to confession and finally, after months, years of holding inside some great guilt, finally open their heart to God and find the grace of healing. There is no joy on this earth deeper than that in the heart of your priest when your life begins to shine with the light of Christ that has the power to illumine the whole of creation. We long to see this. We trust in the love of our God that he will help us to see this. We trust that he will take each of you, his own creation, an icon of his glory, and he will transform your life, if only you will it and allow it, into an image of his eternal splendor from whom we can receive blessing, from whom we can see divine life, and with whom we may hope to enter his eternal kingdom. May his blessing be upon you and upon all of us, and may our lives bear that blessing into the next generation and many more to come. Amen.